It is Podcastlo. Oh! Bada bing, bada boom, and we're in like that. Okay. We haven't spoken to each other in like 15 minutes. True. And then the camera's turned on, and then we just... Oh, you're here. Right back into it. (laughs) Well, you, Mr. Busybody, knows on your phone. Made some notes for the pod. Nicely done. Made some notes for life. Good, good, good. Gave, wrote myself some notes for the future. What sort of notes are you writing? Don't forget underwear. Don't forget shoes. Shoes are important, as it turns out. Uh, don't forget shirt. People don't let you in buildings, usually, if you don't have shirt. How do you plan to utilize um, these notes? I just read them in the morning when Every I wake morning? up. Every morning? Yeah. Say, don't forget shoes. Yeah. Check. Yeah. I mean, if I didn't have the checklist, then... I mean, I would probably be naked right now in front of you, which I know you would like because you're a sick f- But uh, you've got don't shame you've got me a fiance, for that. Don't shame so me for that. You've got to keep it in one keep it in one lane, fella. Yeah, dude. <laughs> you're the dude. I don't know if I like how we started this off. All right, let's start over. Maybe it's a good thing we weren't talking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are you? Fine. Good. I'm glad. I'm not going to go into that any further. I don't want you to. Good. How are you? I won't. How are I'm you? I'm fine. Are you doing okay? I'm fine. Yeah. Uh, I I was hoping not to take you by surprise. I was hoping we could start this on a relatively serious note. Can I say something? Yeah. Welcome to Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I just have a quick spiel. I'll make it really quick. But uh, today is the 29th of July as we're Confirmed. recording this. Confirmed. Um. There's a wildfire near us, near me. Yeah. Not n- not so much near where you live, but it's pretty near where we live uh, in Fort Collins. Definitely, if you're in Loveland, you're probably, well, especially if you're on the west side of Loveland, you're probably getting evacuated from your house right now. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say, like, wildfires suck, and everyone who's getting evacuated, we're sorry. Um, anyone who is under mandatory evacuation that says, fuck it, I'm not leaving. I know it's way too late. By the time you hear this, you're probably already going to be dead. (laughs) But if someone tells you you should leave, that you're in the danger zone, you should leave and you're in the danger zone. I know your house is the most important thing that you have, but that's besides your life. Mm -hmm. No point in having a house if you're dead. So yeah, just do what the professionals tell you and get the fuck out of the way if if, uh, they tell you you should. And then just a tangent off of that... um, People treat wildfires these days like they're normal. Like where we live in Colorado, we're lucky to not have a fire in a year. It's been, what, like one or two since we've had one, a major one? Uh, uh, yeah, three. Well, there was the fire in Louisville. Yeah. Um, a couple of Christmases ago. That was horrible and insane. I think that was 2021, 2022. Something like that. It, it might have been 22, but it. it, it I think it was 21. But no matter what the case, yeah. we go through fire periods where we have like a fire year. Sometimes we get lucky through a summer and we don't have one. But if we don't, then like a neighboring state does or like our neighbors up to the north, Canada, Canada. have a lot of wildfires. Um, and people, yeah, just treat it like it's normal now. Like we should have a shitload of fires all the time. Um, and it's just not normal. Like because obviously we have affected the climate with our presence on this globe. That's an undeniable fact. Um, Some deny it. (laughs) It is undeniable, though. (laughs) If you're denying it and you live in a fire state like Colorado, you're a fucking moron. You're voting against your own interests by continuing to put people in power who deny the fact that the climate is changing. This fire went from like 10 acres to 100 acres in less than an hour and... Like, when we go outside, we can't breathe. So if you think, oh, well, this fire is a city over. I can't see it. It's not affecting me. It is. It's going to affect your ability to be outside. And it's going to take tolls on your health in the future, especially prolonged exposure. So no matter what the case, just be smart. Like, vote for people who believe in climate change. Contact your representatives and push them to make it so that people are held accountable for cutting regulations or doing whatever it it doing whatever happens behind the scenes that continues to make the climate worse. We're at a point now where like we can't go back. 
and we're certainly not going to not have wildfires. You know, it's just inevitable now. This is the world that we live in. But we can still do what we can to not make it, like, worse going forward. Um, and the fact that fires spread so quickly now is due to the fact that we just don't get enough moisture during the right times of the year. Mm-hmm. And the earth is set up in such a way that someone throws a cigarette butt out the window, it's going to cause a 300 plus acre fire if it lands in the right spot. So that's it. That's all I wanted to say, but it just, it's fucking stupid. People need to wake the fuck up and realize that whether or not it's convenient for their reality, like everyone's life is affected by the choices that people make at the top, especially when they are voting against the interest of the people who live in fire danger areas or, you know, hurricane danger areas or tornado danger areas like it's not just fires it's everything so did they determine this one was man-made already you mentioned the no i I, I don't know if yeah i'm not trying to speculate on this one particularly but we've had several fires in colorado started by a grill that got tipped over or a cigarette that got flicked out the window so no matter what the case it's tragic um and yeah we just we live in this world now, so I feel like people might as well try to make it the least shitty that they can. Well said. Well said. I <clears> felt <throat> super sick um, a lot of last week because of the smoke. I went for a run Monday morning just as like the air quality was getting really bad. I didn't realize it. And then starting like Tuesday afternoon into Wednesday, I thought I was like was getting a really bad cold. Yeah. it was just a smoke inhalation yeah no so yeah it's it's <clears throat> wild that um this is just part of the summer season now and something people have just kind of learned to accept it's pretty depressing it's pretty depressing and it's also something that we've seen coming for a while that we still chose to ignore so i don't know seems like we deserve it but the the planet doesn't deserve it like the forests the wildlife areas all the animals that are affected Mm -hmm. they're just trying to live their fucking life so on a brighter note have you been watching the olympics yes the olympics have been hitting me in my soft spot dude yeah it's so nice um i forget the name of the dude did you watch the men's relay 400 relay Mm -mm. it was i think his name's caleb dressel I know his last name is Dressel, but he was the finisher on the men's 400, and it was like his eighth, it's his eighth gold medal, I believe. Uh Uh-huh. Um, and his wife and his, like, newborn were there watching it, and after he won, he, like, ran over to them and, like, grabbed his kid. Is this swimming? Because I thought... crying and... Or track. Uh, swimming. Swimming, okay. Yeah, 400. Yeah, yeah sorry, I should have specified. No, you're good. I didn't think track had started yet. Uh, 400 relay, swimming. Look it up. But yeah, he grabbed his baby, <clears throat> and everyone started crying, and Snoop Dogg was there, and it was just a beautiful moment. Snoop Dogg's everywhere. Snoop Dogg was literally just chilling like, hey, it's <laughs> the Dressels, and then when he won... When he won, the camera, like, went to his wife in the stands with the baby, like, watching, and they were, like, cheering, and Snoop Dogg was there. And he, like, goes for a high five. He's like, fuck yeah! And she, like, turns, and she's like, oh, my God! It's it's (laughs) fucking Snoop Snoop Dogg! Dogg. Like, what's happening? (laughs) (laughs) That's hilarious. I'll have to rewatch. Was this today yesterday i i honestly i I don't know when it actually happened somehow i missed i think i saw it yeah the 27th i think was when i saw i watched the olympics like all weekend how did i miss this i don't know i don't know i literally threw it on uh peacockle peacockle and uh it was like one of the first things i saw when i turned it on that day so i was right place right time i also have been enjoying the olympics i've been watching a lot also what's your been hitting favorite, me in like, the soft spot. What's your favorite like obscure Olympic sport? Uh well, I mountain biking, some may consider an obscure one. For sure. I'm a big mountain biker. I, I watched forget. the uh, women's 
mountain bike final on Sunday. That was exciting because a uh, French racer, I'm forgetting her name, just absolutely dominated. She finished like over three minutes oh, ahead yeah. of didn't, anybody else. Didn't she move from like over halfway back in the pack, like all the way up? No, or she was dominating of, the whole. Oh, okay. You might be thinking of roads. No, the okay, the Olympic, uh, the the American uh, racer in that finished in third, oh, and okay. she moved from way back in the pack. And she had a mechanical issue. I think she had a, a flat tire and still managed to finish in third. God damn. <laughs> no, second, second. Sorry, Shit. she got the silver. Okay. So damn. yeah, that was really impressive, especially since Americans tr- traditionally don't do well in, in cycling. cycling. Um, and it's then, normally like pretty dominated by the French, right? Or does it kind of uh, vary? It varies, but Europeans, you know, um, like in road cycling, uh, the Tour de France just happens and... A Slovenian dude dominated, followed by a Danish dude dominating. Belgium's always really good at cycling. Okay. Um, the men's mountain biking happened this morning, I think, but I didn't watch it, so I'll watch the replay of that. Um, but yeah, it's probably my favorite, like, obscure sport. I don't, there's, I love all of them. Though. Like, there's nothing I'll turn on and be like, I don't want to watch yeah, this. So, it's like, all super entertaining. I watched surfing for a long time Dude, yesterday. surfing's crazy. Surfing's really cool to me because it has like a natural element to it too. Like it's crazy to have th- that as a competition because they're reliant on like the conditions of the ocean that day. Yeah. The one that I was watching yesterday for men's surfing was like, I forget who, I, I forget who was competing, but they had to reset the clock because like fit the first 15 minutes went by and there wasn't a single like rideable wave. Mm-hmm. And then like another 15 minutes went by and there was like one single wave that was like good. And the dude from Japan like got up and did it and he got like a great fucking score. And then the other dude was just out and it's like, well, yeah, there's only one crazy. rideable wave. And the other dude had priority cause he was already, he already had more points at that point. Mm. So yeah, he like had first priority, which is I guess a thing. And so I was like, well, yeah, you can get eliminated because you didn't have yeah, a rideable wave, which sucks. I know. I like that <laughs> element Mazer! of like fate in it though. Like, yeah, man, the gods did not smile, smile down <laughs> upon your run. You're eliminated. Yeah, some fucked up countries probably think that way. Hi, Major. You're you on wanna, the pod right you now. Get the Are fuck you okay down? with being on YouTube? Your identity is being leaked yeah. right now. <laughs> You're so crazy. Maisie, you have to get down. Please. Please. Push her. Um, what's your favorite Spanker event? booty. Get out of here, Maisie. Um, I'm just going to knock over my microphone. <laughs> Sorry. What a oh, mess. she's literally such a giant. What a mess. Pansy. <laughs> um... So, obscure-wise, I would say, well, again, depends on your opinion. Archery is one of them for me. Archery's dope. And foil is another one for me. Um, What's foil again? Like the fencing. Fencing, okay. That's what yeah. I thought it was, yeah. Um, yeah, watch some fencing. That sport's at insane. Mm-hmm. It's like, there's so many fucking rules to that sport. Yeah. yeah. And the fact that you have to move so quickly and think so fast, but also follow all the rules is pretty intense to me. Uh, that's probably it, though. And canoeing, which I wouldn't call that an obscure sport, but it's just super fun to watch. That one's cool too because like they build like a water arena for mm-hmm. it, like a water just, park. <laughs> yeah, natural river going through an arena. Yeah, yeah. I watched some canoeing on Saturday. I think pretty dope. Um, I was gonna relate the Olympics to our topic today, though. How so? Because I was watching this weekend. And for I so I have a pet peeve about this. I don't know if you ever watch like Premier League soccer or anything, but it's become in the last 10, 20 years a tradition to sing the riff to Seven Nation Army. Yeah. Just anytime anything is going on at all <laughs> at any soccer game, whether it's Premier League or World Cups or Euro Cup or German League, it's just what dumb idiots do there's like some statistic about that song yeah so uh, i was watching the olympics and there's a bunch of french people cheering on a french competitor and something and they just started singing seven nation army i was like jesus it's in the olympics too and then right after that um i was watching it might have been simone biles floor routine in gymnastics and she did like her floor routine to a cover and interpretation of seven nation army like right after that weird i know i'm like man 
Jack White, like, is has anyone made more money off of a song Bro, than Jack White has made off of so Seven Nation Army? Ago. Yeah. The stat I was thinking of, I guess it's not like the stat I was thinking of, but essentially earlier this year, Radio X released this article saying that because of how known it is at sporting events, it's become like one of the most widely known melodies like in human history. Yeah. Like, oh, for sure. It's just what dudes start chanting it. at any yeah. time. Like if you watch a Premier League soccer game, almost the entire game, there's someone just singing the riff to Seven Nation Army. And have you ever it's pretty heard, wild. Uh, have you ever heard Jack White talk about the making of that song? Um, I don't think so. It, well, there's like literally no story. Yeah, <laughs> like was he just... was on a broken record, the Rick Rubin podcast a uh-huh. few years ago. And he basically just said like, yeah, me and Meg wrote it in like 20 minutes and we thought it was a nothing song and we just kind of didn't think about it again. Yeah. And then, yeah, it just became what it was. Universal. Yeah. Which I think it was like, it was popular within its cult when it came out, but it went a lot deep. It went a lot further than that. Like, in the following years it wasn't always like it wasn't an instant hit i guess i should say yeah but yeah it's weird i'm sure as an artist it's super weird to think about like what songs wind up like defining your career because they're probably usually the ones that you don't think about yeah at all yeah i know it's it's ridiculous um and like like a lot of player chants in soccer are to that melody too like kevin de bruyne from Manchester uh, City, they're like, oh, Kevin De Bruyne, <laughs> <laughs> the perfect amount of syllables. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's pretty well. And I was like wondering, like, I don't know how this works for licensing, but like, if Peacock is broadcasting an Olympic event where they are singing Seven Nation Army, does Jack White get any royalties? I from was that wondering event? a similar thing. Like, yeah. okay, so. Kind of the inverse, though, if because like obviously you have to you have to buy the licenses to songs if you want to use them, Mm -hmm. like in whatever content you make. Some YouTuber that I watch was like filming while he was at an event where that event was playing music. Uh So like, does he get demonetized because someone else was playing music in the background of a clip of a video that? Yeah, it's so interesting. Anyway, it's. Definitely in Jack White's favor, it's working out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once you hit, I mean, that song went gold like 10 years ago. So, yeah. Here, let's see if there's a set on this. Um, well, I'm looking this up. We are, of course, talking about Jack White yes, today. Yes, not the White Stripes. Jack, not the White Stripes. We white did, Stripes can fuck off. We did a White Stripes episode with Robert. I think mm-hmm. we talked about some Jack White solo. I think we ran there. through the solo, but it was at the end of the episode. We uh-huh. rushing. And to be honest with you, Jack White's solo career is what I care about, like significantly. If we're just think, if we're talking about Jack White, his overall universe, all the different bands he's a part of, his solo shit is like my fucking favorite shit. Yeah. Like if honestly, I was kind of thinking about this on my way home. That classic question of like, if you had to pick one artist to listen to for the rest of your life. For me, I think it would be Jack White, like, seven days a week. I, I don't think I would ever pick anybody else. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, real quick. So I looked up if there's a stat on how much money Jack White has made off of that song. There's a Reddit thread on it. And someone said, generally, performance venues will get a blanket license with the major record labels. This allows them to play any song in that label's catalog. The price for that license is based on capacity, whether or not it's televised, and ticket price, not necessarily what specific songs and how frequently they are played. They do not have someone keeping track of every little music clip they use. So I guess any sports venue is like paying... Um, a lump sum. A lump sum to whatever label Seven Nation Army was released probably on. Probably all the labels. Yeah. Um, yeah, probably all of them, but that one as well. And so, yeah, he's... And I guess it's the it's the venue's burden, not necessarily the televisor's burden to do licensing. Anyways, little uh, just a little music industry, for little jargon for you. A little peek behind the curtain. Um. So that's interesting. You'd pick Jack White. Uh, we uh, who's yours? Mm, I mean, Oasis. Oasis. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. 
I think it, it goes without saying any given year that Jack White puts something out, he is my top artist and all of my top songs are Jack White songs because it does that thing where it's like he puts something new out and then I listen to that for like six months and then I spend the other six months listening to the rest of his albums again because it's just like every time the door gets opened, I just have to go all the way back through everything. Yeah. And I, it's, it's another one of those things. I have a specific memory being in my dad's Fiat and I've already told this exact same story about a different band, but same exact circumstances. We're driving in his convertible and he always cranks it up super fucking loud to hear over the fucking roar of the fucking car. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he throws on blunderbuss by Jack white. And the first song on that, um, is fucking god damn it or no i'm sorry he didn't throw the whole record on he threw on the single and the b-side um and the b-side was 16 salt teens and that song played and i was just like instantly hooked on jack white um and then yeah blunderbuss comes out and it was literally like on repeat for me every time i went anywhere or anytime i had headphones on that was the first thing i listened to and then literally every release since then i it's been the same yeah yeah um we i swear to god we don't purposefully rip off time crisis julian doesn't (laughs) even listen to it but it just so happens that sometimes we have some crossover with the internet radio program time crisis and this is another case because just a couple episodes ago they were talking about jack white and the white stripes and uh what does ezra think about jack white ezra is a big fan for sure and i think he said he was like kind of early into white stripes um was a big yeah, fan of them from like day one collared shirt yeah i like the andy cred um but uh jake longstreth who's like the co-host on that jake is a hater and he's become more of a hater <laughs> as the series progresses and <laughs> it's really great and jake really hated on white stripes and kind of jack white in general and he says uh the only like he only likes the first White Stripes album because it sounds kind of like lo-fi and it's before Jack White like found his voice that we're like so familiar with now and there was like kind of some more like almost like 60s garage rock melodic stuff on the first album. Um, and then after that is when White Stripes really laid down the foundation for what they called like car commercial rock. <laughs> 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 Which is the point I wanted to get to. Um, I've like, <coughs> and, and this is, I, I'm not, I love the White Stripes still. White Stripes were one of the first bands like I really got into. Um, and they were true like innovators. It was kind of everyone else in their wake that really created like the car rock, car commercial rock thing. Like uh, the Hives, for example, even bands like Jet from Australia. Like those were all kind of in the wake of white stripes um so yeah like thinking about it in that view uh maybe changes my opinion on the white stripes a little bit i'm still a big fan but in recent years i've shifted much more to jack white's solo stuff like i consider myself a bigger fan of his solo work than than the white stripes to be honest and this is going to sound conceited but if you are a White Stripes fan who doesn't like Jack White's solo career, you're you're just a moron. Yeah. And I met a lot of people who are like that where they're just like, I only like the White Stripes. Like, one guitar, drums, that's all you need. Fuck anything else. <clears throat> like, you guys are just missing so much truly amazing shit. And, like, each Jack White solo record that comes out, like, you don't really know what you're going to get. Like, you know it's going to sound like Jack White, but it, it still could be, like, a kind of wide variety of different things. Whereas White Stripes, even at their most experimental, which they got pretty out there, but like even at their most experimental, you kind of knew what it was going to feel like. So yeah, totally. I think it's a big leap for someone like Jack White to have a arguably more impactful solo career after being in like a global phenomenon such as the White Stripes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not to yeah. jump ahead too far, but what we're going to focus on is the new album that yes. he's introduced. And I had that thing today when I was listening to it where I like the first two tracks was like, okay, it's blues rock. It sounds like Raji. It's Jack White. I'm not surprised. I probably won't be very interested in this album. And then by the third song or fourth song, I'm like, Oh my, like 
Jack White did it again. He surprised me. Totally different. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, I guess he's it's, amazing. It's one of those things for me where, like, obviously, if you like the formula, you're going to love the product. Um, and so I love everything about Jack White's formula, and I don't really give a shit about how it feels or if it's different or not. It, it, there's just something about his inherent way he plays his instrument and like has a swagger that like as soon as anything new happens I'm just like oh fuck yeah I'm in fully so that was my experience uh, as soon as I heard the first like four seconds of the first song I was like this is gonna be fucking badass yeah. and then I was in in way too deep after that um, but to just take a step back for one second Anyone who doesn't know what happened, I think it's kind of a cool backstory as well. I don't remember the day, and I should have written it down, but it doesn't really matter. I think it was like Friday or Thursday of last week. You told me when I was at the Vampire Weekend concert. That's when you texted me about this, the new album. I so think it was that was like Saturday. Yeah, I think that was like the day after it came out, maybe. Yeah. Um. So yeah, basically. Jack White has some record stores. He's got one in Detroit, one in Nashville, one in London. And people who shopped there on that Friday, and no matter what they bought, they just got an an unlabeled blank test LP slipped into their bag. And there was no there was no pre-context, there was no like forewarning really. I mean, like if you're a deep deep Jack White fan like I am, then there was some some spoilers, but uh Essentially, the record dropped and it was a complete surprise and people didn't know it was a Jack White record right away. Obviously, people had to get home and play it to figure out it was a Jack White record. And then, later that day, Jack White and Third Man Records, who's his record label, and like his photography page, and everyone who's been in a Jack White band essentially previously, they all posted to their stories at the same time just a picture of the blank LP mm -hmm. with a caption that just said, rip it. Nice. Um, so essentially g giving people permission to rip it and put it up on the internet. Um, again, fully free. And one other thing to mention is people who subscribe to the third man vault series, which is just like essentially a quarterly vinyl drop. Mm -hmm. You just get records mailed to your house. Everyone who subscribed to that, also got the no-name LP on Friday. So a lot of Jack White fans got it, and there was instantly speculation, like people were coming up with the song titles almost right away, the album name right away, people were theorizing about what the artwork was going to be, <clears throat> obviously people were theor theorizing about like who produced it, who played on it, all that shit. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the full backstory of the record itself, is like we still don't know what the record's called, we finally know what the songs are called because he played a show the other night and they were selling the No Name record and it has a sticker on it now that has all the, the song titles. But yeah, the record still has No Name. It does have artwork and uh, there's no tour announced, but he is playing some one-off shows uh, with Patrick Keeler, who's the drummer of the Rackin' Tours, mm -hmm. uh, and then Dominic Davis, who's his regular bassist, and then... I don't honestly know the keyboard player. It's someone who's never played with Jack White before on the road, so that'll be interesting. Um, but what I can say about the record itself is definitely have drums from Daru Jones on multiple tracks. We have drums from Carla Azar on multiple tracks. Um, and it seems like Patrick Keeler probably played drums on at least a couple of the tracks too. Um, and then Dominic Davis bass all the way through, I believe. Um, and then that keyboardist, I believe, helped with production and keyboarding. Um, but yeah, that's the record in as far as what we know about it, at least. So, so I listened to it um, on some random YouTube channel. Someone uploaded the album there. That's the link you sent. And uh, so I was streaming it on YouTube in my car and even listening that way. I love how the, the record sounds. Another it sounds amazing. Another great point. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say that and I completely forgot. The vinyl rip that I heard on YouTube also was like, you can tell it's a vinyl rip uh -huh. in spots, but through and through, like, it sounds fucking great. Yeah. So the, the actual record, whenever it comes out and it's not a vinyl rip that's then compressed and uploaded to the internet and then compressed again um, when it's streamed. 
So I'm glad you have all the details on the release. I didn't know he was doing that, dropping it in bags at Third Man Records. That's super dope. Yeah. I know he was encouraging people to rip it. And I got the insider scoop on who tracked it because I literally just commented on one of Dom- Dominic Davis's Instagram posts and I was like, oh, Dominic, yeah? who tracked on this record? And he replied? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's dope. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's the other cool thing about it is, you know, for people who are really in the Jack White universe, like there's been clues that this is happening for a while and they've given us a lot of context as far as like who made the record and stuff like that. So... Jack White's been posting like four second sound bites for a couple months now of just different songs. And then he's also been just posting random pictures and stuff. Um, and so it, what I think, and it seems like what the internet also thinks about the artwork is that it's taken from a photo of Mount Rushmore that he t- posted on Instagram a few months ago. Yeah. I just saw that um, <coughs> about the, who's going to clean up the rubble. Yeah. Um, Which is a cool cool line yeah um and then yeah like everyone who's playing the shows with him started posting like pictures of their instruments like a day before shows were announced and stuff so it's been a very cryptic release it's also been i think super fucking refreshing to have like a surprise release that's just free yeah and if you want it you have to do the work to find it um I, I, I think that's super cool. Some people on the internet have said it's kind of stupid, a little bit gimmicky, but I think it's great. Like, if you want to listen to it, a YouTube search isn't really any harder than searching something on Spotify, um, and you can still download stuff if you have YouTube Premium, so it's all good. And, uh, yeah, I think overall, without spoiling it too much, I, I'm fucking all about this record. Like, it is a return to form in the sense that it's like garage rock and just super energetic, loud, distorted, but it's like the, it's like Jack's version (laughs) of garage rock, like the new Jack. It's got like full bass. Obviously there's some keys. It feels like pretty heavy power trio vibes most of the time, but there's definitely like a touch of keyboards in obviously very crucial spots on the record. Um, and it's a relatively short record. It's only 41 minutes Mm -hmm. or like 45 minutes or something like that. 13 tracks. But yeah, it's got a decent amount of songs and some of the songs are just like short little bangers. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess as far as ranking it or like picking how, how it sticks out among the other records, like it's a little bit too early for me to really say. But I think the main thing for me that's a big surprise is like every record in his solo career, I feel like has been him trying to get further and further away from the OG formula of the garage rock thing. So to see him like circle back to it so many years later and like fully embrace it and like not half ass it and just knock it out of the fucking park is really great to me as a Jack White fan. And like it, it's kind of, it, it it's a good descriptor of like the mystique around Jack White is like everything he does has to be kind of extra. It has to be kind of the over the top. Like it has to be like a hundred and one percent done. Yeah. And like that's why I fucking love him because like I like artists who are over the top. I like artists who lean into like exactly who they are like as hard as they can and and artists who aren't afraid to like necessarily take chances. So. For sure. That's why I think Jack White's and the people who have man. like lore around them and like a a, an internet community that were like super dissect into it and everything. dissect it and you can yeah. like nerd out about it. It's mm-hmm. super dope. Um, I still need to listen to the full album. I think I got through seven tracks so far, um, but my impression so far: some mega guitar riffs, some of his best guitar work i think in a while which yeah is a big statement because i think i believe it yeah i mean when i heard fear the dawn which was his last like heavy record Uh i was also thinking like this is the best guitar work that jack's done in his solo career so like the fact that he keeps upping that bar too is fucking crazy to me Mm -hmm. because the ideas on this record are 
I would say like largely a lot simpler than a lot of his solo shit. Like it's pretty much a riff or two, mm-hmm. pretty repetitive songs, pretty short songs, but like they don't feel old or stale or like it doesn't no. feel like he's just trying to rehash anything. Like the, it still feels like new ideas. Mm-hmm. So, and uh, his voice sounds fantastic. Better than and ever. That, yeah, really, really. And that's um, <clears throat> like the first track called Old Scratch Blues, you know, kicks in with a pretty standard like blues riff. Um, sound, it's a cool riff, I'm not hating on it. But then his voice comes in and, and the production of his voice and just the way his voice sounds, it's a very cool contrast between the grodginess of it. You know, it still sounds grodgy overall, but mm-hmm. like just how well produced and how clean his vocals are. Yeah. It hits really hard. Yeah. And he also throws in vocal layers only in like, I would say, pretty crucial moments of songs. Like it's mm-hmm. pretty much across the board, like one vocal track, maybe doubled or stereo. But then like there's moments where there's a harmony, just like a one or two part harmony. And like it just elevates it so much and it reminds me that like you know jack white is always kind of like said that he's not really a singer but he definitely has like the strongest frontman persona of like any of the musicians that i fuck with besides maybe like tom york Mm -hmm. um so yeah i i think it's just it's a super well balanced record um yeah so old scratch blues first track definitely like a, a bluesy song but yeah. it has it has that kind of swagger that i was talking about where it's just like slow and it has almost a swing to it but it's still pretty straight um and then it opens up into like a fast rocking huge section and everything's just like distorted as fuck and then bless yourself i think bless yourself is cool because it opens up with like a pretty out of time feeling guitar and the vocals seem super random but then everything lines up when the drums come in and i want to note a lot of the drum performances on this record are very Meg White-esque. It's just like yeah. kick on one and three, snare on two True. and four, and nothing else. Um, and there's a couple songs where I feel like I don't necessarily know who played the drums, if it was Jack White or if it was Daru Jones. I try to listen to like how the drums actually sound because it like Daru Jones' drums, they sound super different from everybody else's. He plays like weird size shells. He tunes his drums weird. So it's pretty easy to tell. <clears throat> but overall, like the simplicity of those songs makes me feel like maybe Daru just decided, fuck it, I'm going full Meg White. I, or if the, those are songs that Jack White played drums on. Um, like I said, I've only listened to a YouTube rip of the album, so I can't comment too much on the sonics of it. But from listening to the YouTube rip in the car, it sounds like compared to other albums, the drums are pretty compressed, not much stereo imaging, like pretty just basic mono, you know? Yeah. Uh-huh. I would so. say that as well. There's a there's like one or two tracks where the characteristics of the drums are a bit more personified, but yeah. it's not like obvious at first listen, I would say, unless you're really listening for it. Like me, because if Daru Jones plays on something, like I feel like I need to know it or else I will maybe spontaneously combust. <laughs> um, and then track three, That's How I'm Feeling, which is just, again, a huge open rock song, like rock pop almost, verse chorus verse chorus super catchy hooks uh driving bass four on the floor drums and then uh track four is called it's rough on rats and then parenthetical if you're asking me and that song i wanted to bring up because that's a slide guitar song Mm -hmm. which i don't think we've had a slide guitar song since the white stripes i definitely could be wrong not in his solo career. That I know for a fact. Really? Not a single slide guitar song on Blunderbuss, Lazaretto, or Boarding. I was going to say, I thought Lazaretto, but you know the discography nope. way more than I do, Fuck so no. I'm not going to argue with you <laughs> on that one. Yeah, and it's weird because, I mean, that guitar, that slide guitar that he plays, like it. There, I don't think there's another guitar that sounds like that. That's why he like uses that guitar all the time for all of it, but you know it like as soon as you hear it. You're just like, oh yeah, that's the Jack White slide guitar. Mm -hmm. Um, And then Archbishop Harold Holmes is track five, which I think that song is pretty interesting because it's like, it seems like he's reading a letter that someone else wrote. Presumably the person that wrote the letter was Archbishop Harold Holmes. Um, But yeah, it's just him like talking. It's like a talk. I didn't know that was an actual letter. Yeah, that song's dope. Yeah. And then track six, Bombing Out. That song's like fast paced. 
Bombing Out is where I stopped listening. Cool. Uh-huh. Yeah. Fast paced, three piece vibes, like bass, guitar, drums. Again, kind of like a pop rock song, just yeah. first chorus, first chorus. Fast, quick. 229. Two minutes, 29 seconds. Very quick song. Mm-hmm. And then track seven is What's the Rumpus, which is kind of back into like the Jack White uh, swagger, like got that groove, almost the swing feel to it. Um, but it opens up into a chorus that I would say is like the most like pop rock chorus that he's done in a minute where it's like the the lyrics are stacked or the vocals are stacked, I should say. The lyrics are like super audible and like articulate. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like a phrase that he, it seems like almost a phrase that he's trying to get other people to like say with him, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely like anthemic and poppy for that song. And then the song Tonight, just a straight up banger, not really much else to say. The song Underground, again, slide guitar song, so two on the record. Sorry for the spoiler. Um, but yeah, the Underground rips, and I that's one of the songs where I'm like, I know for a fact Daru Jones played drums on it, so it just kind of makes me like it that much more. But it's got a weird intro, weird drum part, kind of frantic song structure, but overall pretty straightforward. And then number one with a bullet is another just fast, quick banger song. Like, it's in and it's out. Super catchy, super hooky again. Seems like a pop rock song. Very mm. much in the White Stripes world of, like, we're going to repeat a phrase that people will internalize type shit and then 11 morning at midnight very very good song i don't really know how to describe it other than it's it reminds me a fair bit of like the more rocking stuff on uh blunderbuss with just like pretty straight up not super fucked with guitar like it's distorted but it's not crazy distorted it's not super fuzzed out um, and then track 12 missionary kind of the same thing again, quick guitar heavy reminds me a lot of the blunderbuss type rock songs. And then track 13 is terminal arch enemy endling, which that song I would say off the top of my head right now, um, might be like my favorite Jack white closer. Mm of any of his solo records it's super chilling and it starts out super open and kind of desolate and again with the swagger obviously feels like carla azar playing drums on this last song especially like the fills seem like carla azar fills um but it opens up in the chorus and gets super rocking super loud super distorted And then it goes back down to kind of being quiet and then there's another chorus and then it kind of peters out and starts or it ends the way it started, which I think is super cool. Um, And yeah, that's the whole fucking record, baby. I'm excited to listen to it in its entirety with some headphones on. Yes. Tonight. Um, But yeah, crazy to have a new Jack White album. I definitely did not think there was going to be a Jack White record this year. I mean... He only did two years between Blunderbuss and Lazaretto, Uh but then it was like four years till Boarding House, and then it was like five years till Fear of the Dawn, so I thought it'd be like three, four years till we even heard from him again, but then yeah, he started teasing stuff on Instagram like three or four months ago, and I was like, Jesus, are we really getting new Jack White? Mm -hmm. And then of course it came, and blew the internet up or at least the part of the internet that gives a shit about jack white <laughs> which off the heels of like a double release like fear of the dawn entering heaven alive and touring that record as much as he did <clears throat> and then like doing one-off shows for entering heaven alive and all that crap like you think he'd want to just take a couple years off but it almost seems like maybe if i could theorize He's been keeping some garagey tunes like in the back catalog and maybe working on them slowly over time till he had enough for at least a solid release. Cause it, it feels like a bit of a mixtape in some ways. And Daru Jones actually called it, he said mixtape vibes in a video on Instagram. Oh, nice. <clears throat> which also confirmed that he played on it. Yeah. Um, he, yeah, he, he said it was mixtape vibes when he was recording it. So. I definitely get that. Like, there's not a through line necessarily, other than it's like political unrest. I would say, like, he's pissed off about the state of the world, mm-hmm. which is fair. 
Um, but the through lines of like entering heaven alive and fear the dawn where it's like this record is a concept through and through and like the lyrics reference other songs. There's a universe built up within the entire record. And then like entering heaven alive is the same thing to have this be just like these songs are just out and they are what they are. Like it's a super different approach. And I feel like, especially since Jack White's solo career has been so focused on what seems to be like perfectionism, like everything has to be within the universe of that specific record. It's, it, it's refreshing to just have something just, that's just fucking fun to listen to and loud and kind of pointless, but not really like stupid. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, hell yeah, dude. I don't have much more to say about the new album just because I, it's new for me. I haven't even listened to the whole thing. All right, baby. Let's backtrack then. Backtrack. <clears throat> so, for those who are not familiar with the Jack White universe, before this no name record that he just put out, there was essentially like a double release back in 2022. The records came out a few months from each other. So Entering Heaven Alive was July 22nd and Fear of the Dawn was April 8th. So yeah, a few months in between. Um, but these records came out the same year. The whole point of these records was Fear of the Dawn is like electric, heavy, loud, very produced, very layered, lots of... Um, I guess just moving parts for lack of a better term. And then entering heaven alive was like the complete opposite. It was like recorded fully acoustically, fully live. There was no, well, I mean, there's extra shit added obviously cause everyone needs to produce a record, but there's no like clever layering or chopping or post-production really. It's just a straight through kind of record. Um, and I guess these records are good to me. <clears throat> because they kind of separate the duality of Jack White's solo career, like leading up to this point. Because on Blunderbuss, you have like the heavy, the heavy, the rock songs, and then you have like the acoustic jams where it's like there's a fiddle and a piano and it's super quiet. Um, and then Lazaretto is pretty much the same fucking thing. And then Boarding House Reach is a bit different, but this is the first record or the first pair of records where he really separates the ideas and like gives each one full attention. I would say fear of the dawn is like, I mean, up till this point, his most rockin most produced, most like glittery, sparkly, fancy record that he has. And then like entering heaven alive is like the most reduxed simplified, boiled down folksy like americana version of what all of his previous <coughs> shit was so i need to spend more time with entering heaven alive um fear of the dawn i think because it came out first because i was into it just totally overshadowed entering heaven alive for me so i I've definitely like barely listened to that record and it was kind of the same for me because to be honest, and this won't surprise anybody, but the fear, like the the loud Jack White stuff, the rock and shit, is generally what I like. Yeah. So that record to me was just like the perfect Jack White record, and then Entering Heaven Alive was just kind of like, oh, it's it exists and it's good. But I really went back and listened to it a lot There's after no me and my dad saw the acoustic shows or the acoustic show, I should say, because he played most of the songs from Entering Heaven Alive, um, with Daru Jones, Dominic Davis. Fuck, who else? Um, uh, I forget the keyboard player's name, the piano player's name, which sucks. Um, Have I told you I met Dominic Davis? I would cry. That was pretty cool. Oh, you did? Yeah, I met him. Oh, shit. That's... Yeah. yeah. Damn. <laughs> he was playing I with... wish you would have met him when we knew each other better, because then I would have had you, like... It was when I was living in Nashville. Sign a napkin or something. And he was playing with... Some country artist, I'm forgetting who, but I was doing sound for her. Dominic Davis walks on stage so like, dude, uh, big fan. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to like Laz Lazaretto that morning. Damn, that's and then fucking crazy. He walked on stage. <laughs> that's so awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so anyway, Entering Heaven Alive, I went back and listened to a lot after that acoustic show, and I, I gained a lot of respect for it because, in a weird way, and it's probably just because I'm in the Jack White universe and I love all the songs so much, but like these feel the most like Jack White folk songs like not folk in the sense that like they're folk songs but folk in the sense that like 
they've always been known by the masses. Like they just feel familiar. Like they mm-hmm. feel like when I listen to them, I feel like I've always known them, which is they connect with the essential. We yeah. Jack White's very good at doing that. A hundred percent. Probably why Seven Nation Army is so <laughs> <laughs> ripped that riff from true. the soul of humanity. True, true. Um, all right. Boarding. So I remember on the Robert episode, we did rank our favorite solo albums. Yours was either Blunderbuss or Boarding House Reach. Am I right? Yes. Is it Blunderbuss? No. It's Boarding House Reach. It is. Okay. <laughs> I th- I'm confident uh, uh, over a year later, I think I'm confident in saying Fear the Dawn is now my favorite Jack White solo record. But oh, damn. Boarding House Reach is number two. I need to go back to Fear. I probably haven't listened to Fear of the Dawn since like 2022. Okay, so let's just go. Let's just look at the track list really quick. Um, I got it. Taking, Taking Me Back. Okay. That's Which, a great song. It just, it, yeah, it is. Was that the is. first single? Um, I honestly feel like yeah. Heidi Ho. Was Heidi Ho the second single? Uh, Heidi Ho was the third. Taking Me Back released October 18th, 2021. So a while before, the, like oh, six months before right. the record yeah, came out. That's yeah, why. so I was blasting Taking Me Back for, or I wasn't even, I, I think I had a, a Sirius XM radio at the time and my alternative rock stations were. And had then me back fear on the heavy dawn, rotation. And then Heidi Ho, and then what's and the then trick. what's the trick? And what's the trick was released like the day before the record came out, right? April seventh. Uh, yes. April. Yep. Yeah. Um. So yeah, Fear the Dawn again, banger song. It's cool. Taking me back and Fear the Dawn go into each other. It's like a mm. two parter song almost. And then the White Raven. Oh, the first time I heard the song, the White Raven, my my tiny sick little peen got so <laughs> hard that it ripped a hole in my pants, bro. That song, mwah, Chef's Kiss, like it's fucking perfect. I love that song so much. And then Heidi Ho, honestly, has always been kind of like a eh song for me. Yeah, that like, song with Q-Tip. Mm-hmm. I remember that. It's like good for Jack. He finally got his like rock or his rock rap crossover, or whatever that yeah, he's yeah. been wanting for like <laughs> over a decade. Finally, but a major hip hop player. Yeah, it uh, really kind of felt <laughs> like a throwaway song to me in the sense that it's like doesn't go anywhere there's like a part one and a part two but they're not really related to each other and q-tips q-tips presence on that song is arguably not important like jack white could have done that shit and it would have been the same song Mm -hmm. so that song's honestly meh (coughs) but the back half of this record redeems itself so hard for me the song eos phobia is without a doubt my favorite jack white song i've ever heard it's so fucking good. Everything from the drum performance to the production to the fucking vocals, like the lyrics, it's all perfect. Into the Twilight, every Jack White solo record, I guess up until, you know, the No Name record, each one has like a weird instrumental, or not instrumental, but a weird, like mostly instrument focused jam, like halfway through the record. Uh-huh. So this is that one. Into the Twilight? Into the Twilight yeah. is this record. Yeah, that jam. has Dizzy uh, Gillespie on it, mm-hmm. which is funny. And then a classic jazz trumpeteer. Dusk, which is a transition track. What's the trumpeteer. trick? Song goes hard as fuck. And then that was then. This is now my second favorite Jack White song of all time. Even the Eosphobia reprise is so good that I would consider it like my third favorite Jack White song of all time. Damn. And then Morning, Noon, and Night is a little bit more straightforward, but I do love it. And then Shutting My Velvet is such a fucking good song. Like, that record, like, it encapsulates the Jack White rock ness so perfectly, in my opinion. So. Sorry to s- fucking no. jack that shit. Jack it. <laughs> jacking it like i jack my peen when i listen to fear the dawn when you listen to jack you're jacking your peen <laughs> you're jacking my albums all right so Is this then an episode of jacking my peen when i'm listening jack. to jack <laughs> 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 all right i uh, would say yes but i'd probably get arrested so yeah true boarding house reach yes i would say this is his most It's the most produced in a different sense. Like, I would say it has the most, like, sampling, the most effects, and, like, the most post-production. But 
it also is kind of the most scattered in some ways, which is why I love it so much because it feels like when you think it's going to go somewhere, it goes somewhere completely different. Um, but a lot of people consider this like their least favorite one for that very same reason. So it's kind of just like what you like, I guess at that point. Um, but yeah, this, this record was again, like when it came out, it was daily. I remember listening to this yeah. on my way to work while I was at work on my way home from work, like while I was at my house, just doing nothing. I, this record was on 24 fucking seven for me, uh, for about a year. Like it just didn't get old and mm. it still doesn't. I can put it on and I love like every single second of this record. I probably mentioned it the, the last Jack episode we did, but, uh, the song connected by love was that way for me. Like I, I d- definitely spent a lot of time with the album, but um, I just remember showing a bunch of people connected by love and having it on the car all the time. Um, great song, great album. Same with fucking Ice Station Zebra for me. I showed like yeah, every yeah, person I know that fucking song. And uh-huh. I was just like, have you ever heard an intro like this? Like ever? Have you ever heard anything like this? And I remember, um, before Boarding House Reach came out, he did a teaser, which was called Servings and Portions from My Boarding House mm-hmm. Reach or something like that. Um, and it was just like four seconds of each song, like just put together into one track. Yeah. And I remember when the Ice Station Zebra segment came on, I was like, whatever song that is, that. I need that in my life. Yeah. And then, yeah, when that song came out, I was just like, this song is so fucking brilliant. And then I feel the same way about the song Respect Commander. Like, that song... I say this a lot about multiple artists, but the song Respect Commander at one point was, like, my go-to, like, favorite song. Like, if someone said, like, what's your favorite song? I would be like, it's Respect Commander by Jack White. Like, Mm -hmm. God, it's so powerful and good and, and... just like makes me feel dirty when I listen to it. <laughs> mm-hmm. You don't need any more of that though. Feeling dirty. No, I, if anything, that's, I need that's to inherent. take a bath. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So boarding house reach was 2018. And he played a uh, why walk a dog the other night at that show that he played for the first time since 2018. Wow. So I think there might be a little bit of a the, boarding house reach. The revisit. Nashville show that one mm-hmm. okay yeah. yeah very cool yes sir um so bef- the the record that came out before boarding house reach was lazaretto which was the big one for me that was my favorite jack white soul album probably still is spent the most time with it um and a lot of that was timing just like 2014 I was ready for it i bought that album at third man in nashville and the cool thing about that album when it came out was that it was the super LP. Uh-huh. So it had like a bunch of shit that had specifically never been done to a production record before. It had holographs. It played reverse on, I think, side A is reverse or side B is reverse. I can't remember which. Yeah. The inside label. There's a sticker song. There's a sticker song. Um, yeah. A lot of cool. Whatever Easter eggs side. And- I've. Side A has to be the the inside outside mm. because side B, when you drop the needle, there's right. two different channels. Yes. So the needle can either fall into an acoustic only channel or it can fall into the regular uh-huh. song start channel. And then, yeah, side B is definitely the one because that also, when you get to the end, just has the repeating feedback thing. Yeah. So you can leave that on all Forever. day, which, <laughs> which I have. It's a great feature. And yeah. also... Since since Lazaretto came out, holographic records have become, I wouldn't say a standard, but a lot of artists have replicated it. Yeah. And same with the multiple channel drop-in. Uh-huh. Artists have done that. And then I want to say, uh, well, fuck, never mind. I'm not going to say it because I don't want to be an idiot, but say people have taken cues from other aspects of that as well okay well i want to say there's been other records that have come out where the infinite loop is on the last 
like uh, groove of their uh-huh. own. So I Probably. feel like people have stolen that from him too. Maybe, maybe not though. Um, but yeah, so the Super LP was super cool. And also, when Lazaretto came out, they did a big promo for it where they recorded a single live in the Blue Room in Nashville. Yeah, that's and right. And then had it pressed to vinyl the same day. And it was on the sales floor like four hours after it was recorded. Mm-hmm. So that was another big one. And that's like just as when Third Man was getting started. Mm-hmm. When and it was really taken off. Yeah. And, uh, Jack White auctioned off like the moped scooter that drove the acetate from the blue room to the pressing plant. <laughs> so someone That's owns so that crazy. now. <laughs> the lore. The lore. The lore. Um, yeah, I just, I love the record, Lazaretto. Why don't you uh, take us through this one, big boy? Yeah, so it uh, starts with three women. Uh, I got three women. Uh, Red Blonde and Burnett. Which is a cover. A fun rocker. Yeah, it is a cover. Who does the original of that? Like Blind Willie Nelson. Yeah, it's like, it's a, uh, like old blues standard sort of thing. Um, great sounding song. Has some very cool fiddle on that one. Great fiddle all through the album, which is a big draw for me too. Really cool instrumentation. Then there's Lazaretto. Which, um, this might be the most basic thing I could say, but Lazaretto might just be my favorite Jack White song. Dude, it's, it's fucking it's amazing. great. Definitely my favorite bass part. It's the first thing a, I learned how to play on bass. Not, yes. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. first thing, Lazaretto. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's pretty easy to play on bass. Yeah. Great music video, too, which is a big thing for me. Uh, Temporary Ground kind of slows down there. Temporary Ground's a great song. Would You Fight For My Love and Highball Stepper. So tracks four and five. I think those are both singles after Lazaretto. Um, Highball Stepper was the first single. Yeah. Was Lazaretto the second? Lazaretto the... was the second. Okay. And Would You That's Fight right. is the third. Would You Fight For My Love, yeah. Um, it's one of the few records where I can say that f- for certainty. <laughs> yes. The video for Would You Fight For My Love is pretty good, too. Have you ever seen it? Yeah, I have. Good video. Uh, I think that side A, I think side B opens with Just One Drink. Yes, sir. And then, yeah, Just One Drink is good song, too. That's an original, but it feels like it could be a, like a folk like song. A folk, yeah, yeah, a cover of an older song. Um Alone in My Home, Entitlement. Entitlement's great. Kind of slowed down <laughs> piano track. Such a great song. Uh-huh. Um, and then that Black Bat Licorice, which maybe after Lazaretto, that Black Bat Licorice is maybe my second favorite on the track. It's I like love. a ska song almost. Yeah. The Black Bat ska Licorice. Punk. Yeah, very punky. Um, and after Entitlement, it, it, you know, the, the contrast between the two songs hits hard. Um, I think I found the culprit and want and able. Great way to end the album. Those yeah. two tracks. Want and able. And I'm not just saying this because Lazaro is my favorite album, or maybe I am, but I think Want and Able is my favorite like Jack White closer on any of his albums. So um fantastic. So that that's the standard version. And then there's the vinyl version, uh, which after High Ball Stepper has an untitled uh track which is the sticker track um which i need to give another listen i haven't listened to the hidden track in a while uh and it sounds super crazy too because it's you're listening to yeah through through a label yeah through paper and then uh, there's another untitled hidden track at the end of it too, which is very hidden because you yeah. actually have to pick up. Well, I guess you have to do that on both sides, technically speaking. So yeah, it's but you got to find the groove. You have, yeah. They only, they only when they did the video for the Super LP, they only pointed out the hidden track under the side A sticker. So uh-huh. I think it took people a minute to realize there was two hidden tracks. Yeah. Um, um and yeah. then yeah he did third man records vault edition bonus seven inches alone in my home and entitlement demo versions of both of those Hell so yeah. it was a loaded release with super fun release too and that was like as 
vinyl was like that's when the that's when the resurgence was resurgence really, really happening. Really happened. And I it, remember watching him on um like late night shows talking about vinyl and how important vinyl is. Yeah. And that's when they showed I think it was on Jimmy Fallon. I remember watching that. He showed the hologram and um yeah. It all worked. Like Jack White is owed a lot of credit to the vinyl resurgence, I would oh, say. Sure. And it's because of those publicity stunts that he did with Lazaretto. The estate to vinyl was huge um and then also yeah the, just the fact that he was like vinyl can be fun like we can cram features onto it we can make it accessible like to a bunch of people um he he definitely gets a lot less credit i feel like than he deserves for that type of shit um the other thing i will say about lazaretto too is uh this is in my opinion there's like two pretty distinct phases of Jack White's solo career and Lazaretto for me is phase one where it's like we have the blues infused songs mixed with the straight rock songs mixed with the folk songs and so it's kind of like a little bit all over the place like going from Lazaretto to temporary ground is like a pretty harsh yeah. transition and I feel like there was a time in his career when like that's what he wanted was to like be jarring and be like I'm a rock guy but I also do Americana and like the Americana is super quiet and super strips back, but the rock is super layered and super produced. And like that back and forth to me was like an intentional choice that he was making early on in his solo career that then kind of shifted to like, whatever this record is, it's going to be all fully about that. Cause you don't have that on like, there's definitely blues influence on boarding house reach, but it's not as drastically, you know, just segue from one song to another. That's a very good point. Um, so yeah, that's one thing I wanted to say. And then the other thing I wanted to say about phase one, Jack White is the fact that his studio musicians, I would say were playing to his songs a lot more and the sound was a lot more universalized. So like on Lazaretto, like you have Daru Jones playing drums on a song like that black bat licorice, which, you know, there's a little bit of a distinction in the drum sound there, but and then you have Carla Azar playing drums on a song like, I don't know, uh, Highball Stepper. And it's like the same exact drum sound, pretty much the same exact energy, like not too much distinction in personality there unless you're really paying attention. But then on a record like Fear the Dawn, like kind of like I was saying earlier, if Daru Jones is playing drums on a song, like he's using his actual drums and like you can tell that it's like a different drum set mm -hmm. and you can tell Jack White's also saying to him like, play what you want to play for this, like get weird for me and like encouraging the personality to show through a lot more. Yeah. So I would say like Lazaretto in phase one is like a Jack White record, but then like a Fear of the Dawn record in like his phase two is like it feels like Daru Jones plus Jack White plus Dominic Davis like everyone has a lot more of a say creatively so I just think that's a really cool duality to it like you can have both and they're both executed to perfection very well said and a very important point and to expand on that the tour after this record um, picked up a lot of attention was cool and innovative because he had two different that was bands. The tour. That was Wonderbus. Yes, oh, okay, I'm mixing it up. It's okay. where he had a female band and a mm -hmm. male band. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the Lazaretto tour that was blended was in time Dario for me. Jones, Dominic Davis, Dominic Davis, and then Fats Kaplan who played pedal steel, um, and then Lily May who was like the female vocalist and she played fiddle, and then. Ike Owens started the tour, but he unfortunately died of a heart attack, and he was replaced by the keyboardist uh, from Queens of the Stone Age, Dean Fertitta. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and then, yeah, that's God, I wit here, fill the silence because I want to find the dude that played keys on Boarding House Reach because he's also the same dude that played here, keys. I'm gonna be able to have it right here. Um, on the boarding house reach tour he had two keyboard players one of them was um fuck i forget both of their names dj harrison <laughs> no it's quincy something neil evans neil evans was on quincy house mccrary reach. quincy mccrary yeah yeah and so quincy mccrary 
on the boarding house reach tour and on fear that on tour was like the dude that I watched m- more than anyone besides Tari Jones. Um, because like he's, he's literally so fucking good. And like when we saw the acoustic show in Santa Fe, pretty much every solo was him just a, an upright piano. And like, I mean, he's, he's just, he's so good. So that's definitely safe. wanted to shout him out. Um, all right, well, let's talk Blunderbuss before Blunderbuss. we wrap this shit up, because I... You got a tinkle? Uh, no, I was saying I'm embarrassed I fucked up the oh. <laughs> information for the Lazaretto tour. So let's just no, get okay. off of it. It's supposed to be my favorite album. I don't even fucking know anything about it. <laughs> well, you weren't there, so you wouldn't know. Yeah, I wasn't there. I think Jack White's the only musician where I've never missed a tour. He is one of like the big ones who I'm a big fan of who I haven't seen. Very We're regrettably, going to the next one, baby. yeah, I'd love to. He's the best live musician I've ever seen. His band is yeah. the best live band I've ever seen. The amount of audibles they call. So, for anyone that doesn't know, Jack White doesn't use a set list. He calls the songs in the moment while they're on stage. So the set's completely different every single night. You never know what you're gonna get. The band literally doesn't know what they're gonna get either. Half the time. Jack White will lead into a song with an improvised jam and the band literally just follows him until he calls the song and then they go into the song. Like Mm -hmm. they play stuff on one night that they will literally never ever play again. So like you get a completely different experience every single time you go to a Jack White show, which is just next level for me for a live musician. The other thing is I was listening to obviously a Daru Jones episode on a podcast and uh, he was saying for the Fear the Dawn tour that they did, there was like 250 plus songs in the back catalog. Damn. So when they sign on to the tour, they get a binder that's just full of the tablature or whatever, the the sheets for each song that they're expected to learn. And it's like every song in the White Stripes catalog, most of the Rack and Tours, most of the Dead Weather, and then a shitload of covers that, you know, they might never play. Um, and then, of course, everything from the Jack White solo career because, you know... The other night, he called uh, Why Walk a Dog? Uh Uh-huh. And he hasn't played that since 2018. Like, you just have to be able to know it at a moment's notice. So I say his live band is the best live band in the world for that reason. Specifically, the live band of Dario Jones, Dominic Davis, and uh, Quincy McCrary. It was just, like, next-level musicianship. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Even, like, Sumac, where, like, their eyes are closed for like the entire set all their eyes are closed and like they're still perfectly in sync with each other like somehow the jack white band just edges that out slightly of being like just so locked in because they don't know where they're going they don't know what's going to happen next and yet you could never tell that from watching a show yeah yeah that's yeah amazing um speaking about speaking of what a genius jack white is did you see that video that was viral recently of him naming Beatles songs within one second. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love that shit. That shit's insane. Yeah. So crazy. He's probably like, you know, it gets tossed around a lot and like a lot of people have a lot of opinions and they're all valid obviously. But like, in my opinion, I would say Jack White would be like the most prolific musician, like of my personal lifetime. Like yeah, the amount of, things that he has done in a short period of time like flawlessly every time is just unparalleled in my opinion like there's no one else that functions at that high of a level and knows that much about music like he's truly a historian when it comes to knowing his shit so and although you know i'm not as big a jack white fan as you are i'd say like between white stripes raconteurs the dead weather jack white solo stuff there's maybe no one in my life who has played a big role in music as okay. Jack White. So like, like just think by about, pure volume yeah. and numbers of hours listening to, it's it's Jack White. 100%. Yeah. Uh, just because of also, yeah, the sheer amount of volume of releases that he has across multiple bands and stuff. But like, just think about, we always, well, not always, but we do bring this up frequently of like the idea of, people not knowing the artist but knowing the song. Yeah. I think Jack White's like maybe the most quintessential example of that. Cuz like a lot of people if you ask them like if you know Jack White is 
they'd be like, I have no idea who that is. Yeah. And you play three seconds of Seven Nation Army, and they're like, oh. oh that, yeah. Or um, We're Gonna Be Friends is another one where yes. it's like universal. Yeah. And then if we're talking like Tours, like Steady As She Goes, like that song was one of the biggest songs of the 2000s when it came out. For sure. Um, and I mean, even Dead Weather has... Uh, hanging from the heavens, which again, like gained success because it wasn't a film, but um, each group that he's in has at least one like universally acclaimed song. So yeah, that is. I just saw something linked to his Instagram. I saw he has only six hundred thousand Instagram followers, mm -hmm. but well, he's only had an Instagram since twenty twenty two. True. Okay, that's a contributing factor. But yeah, it's funny. Like Seven Nation Army. There's a case to be made. It's the most well-known song on the planet, perhaps. Yeah. And yeah, the dude who wrote it and sings it has like less than a million Almost Instagram anonymous. followers. Yeah, yeah, it's insane, and it, it's insane in a good way. Like, I don't want to sound like a gatekeeper by any means, but like, you don't want to see the thing that you love get like tainted by whatever notoriety, fame, success. And Jack White is one of, I think it's like Jack White, Tom York. Flea, those are like three dudes where I could say like no matter what, they're always going to be exactly the same. They're always going to be about exactly the same shit. Flea is funny to throw in there. Yeah. But I, I, <laughs> I, I, I agree. Can't argue that. Um, but yeah, so I just think that's cool again about Jack White, like as a fan, knowing that no matter what he chooses to do, it's going to be like high caliber and done to like his fullest potential possible. Yeah. The other thing I want to note that is kind of just a, an interesting aside for me Every time he releases an album, he, like, builds himself, like, a new custom guitar or, like, three or four. Yeah. So this time around, the guitar I've seen so far is another um, telly, but it's, like, again, got, like, six pickups and a kill some switch. pictures of it. It's black this time or, like, super dark blue, so which is sick. really cool. Um, but, yeah, I feel like each time he does that for a record, even his specific jack white guitar sound kind of changes a little bit because like mm. the, the guitar sounds really familiar on this record but then it also sounds pretty uniquely different from like the guitar on say like 16 saltines from a blunderbuss or like a you know, like a respect commander like there it's all pretty different and like on boarding house reach he was playing uh like music mans and stuff he was playing like the saint vincent music man and a couple other just like weird kind of boutique guitars but in general, I think that's cool because his whole thing with White Stripes was like, I'm going to play the shittiest gear that sounds the worst and like yeah. is the old, most old unreliable. Old silver tone guitars and yeah. shit. Yeah. He was playing a triple caster. <coughs> is that what that's called? At that uh, Nashville show. I just saw it. Yeah. That's... Um, and then outside of guitars, like, you know, it's kind of a new persona for each album, too, like just in terms of different way of dressing different yeah. haircut mm -hmm. different way of presenting to the to the world that's true yeah he i remember like <laughs> this is gonna sound super fanboy of me to say but me and my dad saw the lazaretto show at red rocks uh-huh and it was when he'd got his haircut when it was like super short on the sides and very long on the top and he had it like completely mopped back uh -huh. um he came out on stage and I was just like, holy fuck, like he got a haircut. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. up until that point, Jack White had always had the exact same Long hair. Long hair, middle part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then that was a whole thing. And then the hair was back for Boarding House. And then it was gone for Fear of the Dawn. And his hair was blue for Fear of the Dawn. And now it's like long and it's black again. So I feel like he definitely uses that definitely to like characterize where he is for each album. Um, one other fun fact about when we saw the Lazaretta show at Red Rocks. <coughs> it had been raining a lot it was raining when they came on stage like two songs in he jumped off his wedge and rolled his ankle oh shit so wait at red rocks at red rocks oh. so he took off his boot and played the rest of the show barefoot <laughs> in the fucking rain <laughs> Damn. with a fucking baseball sized purple ankle Ooh. and they posted a picture of his ankle on instagram the next day and i was like bro like I couldn't even stand, let alone like jump and run and do all the shit he was doing at that show. So respect, craftsman. What a badass. Um, all right, bro. Great episode. Hell yeah! This is one thing that I could talk about forever. Definitely. <laughs>
Well, uh, I th- I would love to do a rack and tours, and I think we probably talked about this, like just do a spinoff bands, uh, sewed in the future. Um, so yeah, that will come one day. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening. Go check out the new Jack White album. Let us know what you think of it. Yeah, he gave us permission to not only rip it and upload it, but then to obviously also consume it that way. So. Mm-hmm. Anyone who is like feeling bad about listening to ripped music or unofficial releases, like this is one instance where I would say, fucking do it. Don't deprive yourself of the experience because this is part of the experience. Listening to the shitty vinyl scratch version on YouTube is, it seems like that's the way he wants us to be consuming this record right now. So fucking go for it. Jack White's papered. Don't worry about it. (laughs) He's got that cake. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. We love you. Goodbye.